our moderator for the evening. Um, Miren Arsanios is the author of The City Outside the Sentence from Ashkel Awan, Beirut in 2015. Her writings have appeared in publications such as The Brooklyn Rail, The Rumpus, The Outpost, and, uh, and others. She co-founded the collective 98 Weeks Research Project in Beirut and is the founding editor of Magazine Magazine. She holds an MA in Art Theory from Goldsmiths College and a writing MFA from Bard College. She currently lives in New York. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks to three of you for these um, amazing performances and for sort of blending so beautifully the page with the stage and bringing attention to the performative nature of language. So um, thank you for, for your readings and presentations. Um, when I was thinking about, um, I'm kind of responding to what you just presented, and I was thinking that we probably can start talking a little bit about cartography a little bit, and geography, and um, thinking about your three uh, readings. Um, um, it, it struck me that, for example, the, the, the relationship to, to um, to other places, other, let's say, let's say like, not not here, like, um, is very present. So, Melissa, um, you have your piece is titled uh, Secret Catalan Poem, and I think it was produced while you were um, away in Europe on a, on a residency of some sorts, I think in the UK, and later you spent some time in Spain. In Basida, you talked about your, sorry? You said my name so well. Okay. <laughs> you talked about your. I was like, no, did I get it wrong? Okay. Um, you talked about your residency in, in Jerusalem. So also, uh, you know, you, your text sort of comes from that experience. And um, uh, um, sorry, Gosu, you you talked about uh, Turkey as this bridge between the east and the west. Um, so I just wanted to bring back the attention, it's like I wanted to sort of, um, maybe you can start talking about the relationship of your writing to, um, to this experience of, of place, and um, what's the kind of, what's the transaction there? You know, like you go somewhere, you bring back these secrets, these secrets, and, and you share them in here, and so I was thinking about this this kind of exchange. Is it an exchange? And um, and again, like um, you know, Asira, thinking about your experience there and bringing it here to this kind of audience. Um, so yeah, so just I, I'm thinking just more generally of of writing and location, writing and geography, and how we can map how your concerns can be mapped in different places, and what does it mean to actually perform it here, what kind of audiences, what when you write or when you think, what kind of audiences you have in mind. And it doesn't need to be like a, an audience in a specific country, it could be something that's more like transnational, but um, or something more digital or something, etc. So there are different kinds of sort of spaces and um, yeah, so I don't know, do you have any responses or ideas that sort of talk about that? When I was in Ramallah and Jerusalem, in terms of your you know, response to your question, I really felt American. And that was a very, very important experience for me because, you know, someone who's not so well traveled, you're always kind of like kicking around this idea of like, what am I? I'm trying to wedge myself in here and there you know, when you're here in, in America. But then when I was there, it was super evident mm -hmm. what I was. Right. And so like somehow that felt kind of good because mm -hmm. I was like mm -hmm. a thing. Right. But then it was also like, oh, this is um, mm -hmm. in places and geographies all over the world, you can also see how the decisions of larger infrastructures affect other spaces and create mayhem. Mm -hmm. 
And that was like what I took away the most from it. So that was important. So I need to go travel, so help me out. <laughs> For me, um, to be honest, I am a white Turk, mm -hmm. and in Turkey I grew up with this whiteness, mm -hmm. and uh, as a privilege, in a privileged position. Um, and when I started study, started studying um, interior architecture through my friends and through art, mm -hmm. I discovered like okay, the problems. Uh, who is the terrorist? Is it the state or is it the Kurds? Or is it mm -hmm. And then when I moved to Berlin, Germany six years ago, there I'm not white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there I'm Middle Eastern mm -hmm. uh, in the society. Oh, you don't like that, look like a Turk. Or at the immigration office, how they behave to me. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you, then I understood, actually, it was a really good experience thinking about, you know, because if we discover the things through art, it has a certain distance. Of course, I have friends who grew up in Diyarbakir, and I have been talking with them, but experiencing this in Germany, mm -hmm. on the streets, on different places, and still I sometimes, um, uh, of course, it's not the same with living and growing up in, um, different parts of the world, like one of them is from Ankara and the other one is Berlin, still is the British position, yeah. Then I started to understand these um, subtle nuances of racism, mm -hmm. or right. what is color, what is, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, on January 1st of this year, I climbed this uh, mountain range thing called the, uh, the Bunkers of Carmel, which is in the neighborhood of Canbaro in Barcelona. And um, I offered a rose in exchange for a written secret. And the roses cost me three euros, so I was joking to the curators that this is the most expensive text I've ever written, except I didn't write it. Um, and I'm glad that you asked about cartography because, uh, and also I really like the word transaction because it was a non-commodifiable uh, transaction between us, non-monetary at least. Mm -hmm. And yet there was a transaction rather than just saying, do you wanna sign this clipboard? Do you wanna give me a secret? I promise I'm not gonna read it. I'm gonna shuffle it and then I'm gonna go to New York on January 24th and other people are going to read your secret. Um, so it was those things. Um, Canbaro, or actually Carmel, for, I, I don't think, I think it's becoming a little bit more fashionable to go to the bunkers, but they're the highest altitude in Barcelona and they offer a 360 degree view of the city, so that's the tourist attraction. But really what they are are anti-fascist uh, defense system. So for me, it carried this like the idea of a bunker, and I know that the question of identity and war has come up before, but as someone who was partly brought up in um, shelters during the Iran-Iraq war um, in Tehran, like the idea of the bunker has always held like a, a, a fascination for me because of the valence it carries. On the one hand, there's this very negative charge of red alerts and paranoia and fear, and then on the other hand, there's like a real protectiveness. Like these people went to the bunkers of Carmel and survived the attacks on Spain. So that site of, uh, I think someone there called it like extracting the secret in a site like that was very, very deliberate. Mm -hmm. Having said that, when you're carrying roses, um, one of the things that happens to you, one of the things that happened to me, uh, which I found somewhat humiliating in many ways, is that people think you're selling them, that you're one of these people of the working class who goes and like begs couples to buy a rose for like two euro or something. And that brought up maybe more than the question offers, like a lot of a perspective and a little bit of a reckoning with myself because of the self-consciousness that like, 
wait, wait, I need an excuse to talk to you, so there's a rose, but I'm not selling you a rose. And like people would be confused, some people actually offered their secret and then wanted to give me money. Like the idea that you can actually have this social encounter in public and not have it be mediated by money is something that I think actually crosses boundaries, right? I mean, I think if you were to go to Tehran or New York City or Barcelona, you would have a similar reaction. And so that transactional question is really important. And then I think underlying it too is like the steps involved, like first extracting a secret and having that um, exchange. Then I brought them over. Um, so customs, of course, is not like really interested in 36 sheets of paper. They're really interested in like, how much liquids are you carrying in your toiletry bag or like my hard drives from the residency or whatever. And then the third part, which happened this week, was translating them because they were in Spanish, Catalan, French, and as you heard, like English as a second or third language speaker, which I left unchanged. And then the fourth problem, or sorry, I, it's funny, I should say the Freudian slip of a problem. But the fourth dilemma or the fourth iteration of it is what happens when you, the secrets these in the private domain are made public by someone else. In other words, someone is confessing for you. And then there are these secrets that kind of fall flat, like that wasn't, right, right that those moments of like what someone guarded with such um, maybe shame or whatever, that that suddenly has a, has a very different valence once it's carried over and, you know, translated or transmogrified. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that just to go back to this idea of um, identity is something that's contextual, so depending on where you are, you choose to, you know, identify as something in order to respond to, you know, the structures that are demanding that of you, but also to fight back certain structures, so you can sort of choose to identify as something or something else, or also you are being identified from the outside as something or something else. But, but going back to this idea of identity, visibility, and secrecy, um, and, and also um, I want to link that to your text, Basira, um, and this idea of the artist also as being this, um, the kind of regime of visibility or the demands around, you know, um, the, the persona of the artist as this, you know, hyper-visible person who travels and, um, and just, you know, stays somewhere and makes a work and exhibits it, you know, like an exhibition is a space of visibility, etc. So, so um, maybe what your answer is making me think about is that, is that secrecy and probably um, there are different ways of, of sort of negotiating these demands, right? So secrecy and probably invisibility, or I don't know if invisibility is the right word, but, but ways of countering that demand for visibility could be, you know, something to think about or something generative in thinking about identity. So, um, yeah, I, thought, I remember talking a little bit about secrecy in the text, and it's funny, like, we all kind of, like, are on the same tone because we're somehow talking about how we were privileged or included mm -hmm. and then how we were excluded. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, our position was shifted and we saw this other thing. And then in terms of the privilege of being bunkered. So for example, what you were saying about the bunker <coughs> and surviving war through a bunker. My mom in India survived as a child through the partition because she was also bunkered. And there's a, a wrap of privilege in that and then there's also an exclusion in that. And, and then how does that history transmutate onto your child or your, the person that comes after you, after your lived experience? Um, and I actually saw a lot of that in the work tonight, how like you're channeling the generation of trauma mm -hmm. and archive in your work. Um, so, <laughs> I was also thinking about, um, you know, the position of the art artist 
Uh, before Berardi has uh, the saying mm -hmm. like the, the post -nom nomadic mm -hmm. market, like because mm -hmm. the no mm -hmm. like, they is a nomad. But I was when I was interviewing Ahmed Oud, he said one thing that he grew up in the Arbaker and he didn't grow up in a pr privileged position, but he's mm -hmm. in a really privileged position right now if you look from a distance. But he told me that he has been having a lot of problems because of his passport. He, you know, even though he mm -hmm. seems like he's this artist, mm -hmm. contemporary artist, right, right. Like, yeah. but there is still, if you look at from mm -hmm. an institutional level. Unfortunately, there are still those problems. And another thing about what you said about cartography, I was thinking a friend of me, a, fr a friend of mine, told me that in Japan, the maps uh, are different. I didn't know that Japan is the center of the world, mm -hmm. which is beautiful, I think. And I was thinking that should be more the colonial cartographers or queer cartographers that uh, proliferate the idea of a different map. It's not the, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. On that note, I was also listening to an interview yesterday, and uh, I think it was on Democracy Now!, and uh, the, there was a president of a country, an island, uh, I think it was south of Australia, I now forget the name of the island, sorry, but, but this island will sort of disappear in the next you know, 30 to 50 years. And I think it has 600,000 inhabitants. And they made a documentary on that island as being the center of the world, as in sort of also predicting what, you know, the future catastrophes or how, you know, this, it's, it's important that everyone looks at this island as, a, as an example of what, what might, may, may happen to, to, you know, the rest of humanity. Or, but yeah, this, this idea of the center of the world is, is interesting. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking this, this word that you use, Avasina, transmutate, um, and three representations in the um, with, um, with you and Basira, uh, there's this idea of um, the body in transformation, so this Frankensteinian idea of becoming, uh, in your performance, there's this idea of the cyborg or of creatures, um, so, um, I don't know if you want to talk about that, this process of becoming, and if there's any, I don't know, how you, how you, if language is connected to that process of becoming and how, um, or is it, yeah, I have lots to say about becoming, mm -hmm. in terms of queerness or, you know, Judith Butler, but yesterday I started I should have, like, it would have been good if I could have finished it before coming here. But I started reading an article about, from a queer writer about how becoming is actually normative. Mm -hmm. But it's so sad that I, I don't know, like, I just, right. yeah. But it's, it's mm -hmm. yeah, I've never thought about it like that, about this idea of becoming as a potential, potential to, um, as a potential to change things. Right. I, I was always thinking about it like that. Right. But the writer was mentioning, like, what if I don't want to become anymore, but I'm a being. Yeah. But yeah, anyways. Maybe there's that Just expectation or that yeah. pressure yeah. To, to transform or become something else. Yeah. Um, which is a lot Just, of yeah. labor on the, on, yeah. the, on the part yeah, mm -hmm. of the person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess I want to um, graft on to what you said, the last word, which was language, and what language specifically, the act of like writing down, and what, what importance or interest or fascination that still holds. And I was thinking about um, this like desperate need to know, mm -hmm. and my own desperation for knowledge, and how you know that sort of cliche of the more you know, the, the the more humbling and like the smaller you become in a way, and that like reaching the asymptotic limit of knowledge is what I've been thinking a lot about. Like how closely can I know? And in a way, it's almost farcical because you're like close, like asking people for a secret in a specific area where um, urban or cartographic region um, 
it's almost like how closely can I read that city in a way? Because in the end, it sort of it doesn't really matter what city it is. Like some of the names are Catalan or French, and they're read by people of various ethnicities and backgrounds. It doesn't really truly matter, but it's just sort of this. I don't know, I say farcical, like, kindly. I'm not saying that this is a farce. And mm -hmm. I have kindness toward this question and this urge, and I think that came up in Basita's work as well, this, like, veracity and voraciousness for it. Um, the, the, the booklet that Belladonna, the chapbook that Belladonna published was not this. It's called Alphabet of an Unknown City. And the tangential relation is that the other like linguistic device that I really care a lot about is the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And so this is an abecedaire, kind of a, a self-written dictionary. And I care about it because it's so severe, it's so pedantic, and it's practically authorless, right? I mean, there's a Webster's and there's, I guess, the Oxford, but they're written by thousands of people over the course of centuries, like the most democratic small d uh, product produced in language is the dictionary and it virtually has no author and it expands beyond their lifetime so then I thought this is also a moment to be extremely personal so that one of the entries like S would be secret Catalan poem is extremely contingent and urgent to me now in January 2nd 2017 for example so like time and space management can be very very personal um, almost like, almost absurdly, whereas the form itself is very pedantic and very severe. Right. Um, does that make sense? And very male. And very? And very male. Yeah. I mean, it's a very democratic system, architectural system built by... The, the dictionary, you mean, right? Yeah. It's a lowercase d, mm -hmm. very long, authorless system of white cis male. Yeah, and I guess that you're, you're I'm digesting. <laughs> and I guess that you're all somehow involved in acts of redefinition, uh, you know. And and I mean, the, the just the fact that taking on the a dictionary project, for example, or um, um, go to your case uh, in your Belladonna chaplet, you talk about how you're frustrated with the word breakup. Um, you're involved. We're in this relationship, and you're. You know, you're corresponding with a you, uh, and you're going through a breakup, but you're also contesting the word because breakup signals or comes with a certain violence that you associate with a heteropatriarchal kind of um, the heteropatriarchy, and and so you're you're trying to sort of push back against you know that language. Mm -hmm. um, and Basita, I think you're engaged in also. I mean. I, I read your text as wanting also to redefine what the artist is, you know, as, as a figure, uh, and these labels, you know, that are associated with um, uh, with these kinds of positions. Um, so, yeah, do you, you want to talk about um, what sort of drives you to want to redefine um, either words or concepts that um, are close to you? and integrate this experiential, experiential subjective, maybe, um, side to, to the word, or, yeah. I guess I'll just say really briefly that I care about, I like the way you formulated that question. I care about performance or text or any myriad of, of media, not because they're defining, but because they offer an opportunity to not take anything for granted. Right. The thing becomes performative if it can if it can actually not be taken for granted, right? Like right now, we have to kind of suspend mm -hmm. disbelief that there's like you know four bodies on stage, that there's lighting, that it's being recorded, mm -hmm. that there's a, an artistic artifice around it, right? right? <coughs> like our art and then quotation marks, you have to suspend a lot of disbelief for that to happen. But what could make something art, I think, right. without the quotation marks, and I think what your text got at so beautifully is that it actually takes nothing for granted, and that area is very lonely and quite dark. 
and, and, and also I think very seductive and wonderful. Um, so I think that's the driving force is like, how can you not take any of these elements or particles for granted? I'm going to kind of link it, link it to the question of becoming and your text. And at the beginning of 2000s, there was a website in Turkey called The Confessions. Mm -hmm. And as an anonymous being, you could yeah, confess anything. And we were all just like scrolling down all those confessions. And maybe end of 90s as well, yeah. And I was a teenager, I was thinking like, wow, I didn't know that like such things happened in Turkey. <laughs> you know, I was like thinking it's, of course, like, uh, it's a secular country, but I was also thinking that it's quite, quite conservative. And in terms of becoming, like there are all those becomings and like hidden, but from the surface you see one presence of uh, performati performativity of this uh, heterosexual being mm -hmm. and also thinking about language and how language also shifts the way you perceive the world mm -hmm. and why yeah. yeah when we change the words and also the understanding of our worlds changes also like you know if I talk about my secrets if we yeah, instead of talking, the of course, theory is important, but instead of talking theory, what if we just start talking about like our secrets, what kind of a becoming comes out of it, or yeah, yeah. yeah turn into a brainstorming. So I can <laughs> find it. Um, I, I mean, I feel like I, I can't say so much about this particular portion of our talk because there was so much of it said in my particular text. Um, but one thing I can say about what both of you presented uh, so far is um, I found this weird particular, so I have this exhibition coming up at Sculpture Center on Sunday from 5 to 7. Please come on. Um, I'm trying to finish the installation. <laughs> but um, so the, what I'm presenting is a space called um, karaoke, uh, Yeah, well, Daphne, it is essentially, I don't, I don't remember what it's called because I'm a little tired, but um, it's essentially like, oh, it, it's called Karaoke Spiritual of Love. Okay. It's a space um, that is, as Daphne says, from Fully Books, um, <laughs> says that um, it's a, like a space that I started to pick up that is picking up on like issues of secrecy and uh, like how architecture is that. Mm -hmm. and how like queerness um, is a thing that has come up in a space not necessarily connected to the theory of queerness mm -hmm. but it is a, it is architecture specified for understanding the becoming of your sexuality or your gender mm -hmm. or who who it is mm -hmm. the fuck you are you know like mm -hmm. underground mm -hmm. under commons kind of space right. and i started to understand there's like a repetition of the architecture and the, the kinds of like nuances of that. And then mm -hmm. I found out that there are actually like little sex rooms in mosques all over the world. They're not really sex rooms. You don't go there and fuck. You go there and you get a temporary marriage license to fuck. <laughs> and it's a call. The And so, I mean, and these are all over. They're in Iran, they're in Turkey, they're in you're in Egypt, they're in Pakistan, they're, they're places. And they're just different rhetorics, you know, different dictionaries. And um, so I kind of like smushed all those kinds of ideas together, went to Miami, took pictures, mm -hmm. you know, and then like put this space together. So it is about becoming, essentially. Mm -hmm. I just also want to maybe, I, I also think maybe, Seeing queerness as like it's not only about sexuality. I think it's also about the methodology. Right. I have heterosexual queer friends yeah. that deal with time differently yeah. in their works, or deal with language differently in their works, and they're so open with 
I think it's the methodology is yeah. really important yeah. as well. Yeah. It's not only about yeah. Yeah. facts. Yeah. 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 No, it's true. And I also just want to say maybe something uh, that relates to queer time as a time that's not of course, uh, linear or marked by, you know, or beginning. It's not 15 minutes late. <laughs> no, it's not that. Yeah, yeah, or it's not marked by beginning or end. Um, and the way that maybe all of your work, to some extent, sort of uh, incorporate um, um, rituals, you know, rituals either through performance or, um, you know, just the act of sort of collecting secrets. Or of you know performing, or uh, I see that also that your, your performances. So I, I I would like to think maybe about performance as these acts of sort of rituals that do not fit within a certain kind of normative idea of time. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's some that's something appealing to me to sort of I don't know like um, to to. Yeah, to think about other ways of conceiving of time mm -hmm. and how these rituals are actually engaging a larger community, etc. So there's something like repair, like reparative, and in, in these actions, um, yeah, that present maybe another kind of temporality and another kind of writing and language. Um, I was just gonna say internet, <laughs> internet, yeah. Um, I don't know how much this relates to temporality, this might be askew, but uh, I was thinking about the performative call of the internet and social networks that there was a time, I want to say like 2011 or something, like the more confessional a tweet or something would become, the more it was just like liked mm -hmm. and liked and liked. I think that's very kind of standard now. Mm -hmm. And I just like, you know, especially coming from a culture where yeah. naturally you're just like raised to right. to maybe not put everything out there mm -hmm. and like having that self-censorship natural, like, maybe unnatural, yeah. but um, conditioned response to it. I was really fascinated by that. And in doing this ritual, I guess, as you call it, that there is still restraint, that people still in the performative age of social media or whatever, mm -hmm. people still have, you know, a secret. I think we skipped maybe two, mm -hmm. and I think they were both about suicide. So I don't know if that was like by mistake or someone didn't want to read it or whatever, but that, you know, you might not necessarily always put that out there, that there's still restraint and there's still opacity. And I don't know if this is a manifesto of sorts, but, I believe in that opacity. I believe in the right to hold the secret. I believe in um, the importance of, of, of opacity and transparency is a giant yeah. fucking lie in many respects. And, and the power of being hidden in plain sight, as Winnicott says, which is, which is all our fantasy, to be right. hidden in plain sight, yeah. according to him, that is. Um, so I just want to say that like the internet is also more than like a parallel reality. Mm -hmm the supposed like keeper of secrets and yet there is like infinite opacity in there as well. We are still like we're I don't know if this is nauseating, but like we're still human because of those secrets and that restraint. Um, do we have time for a few questions from the audience? No? Okay. Um, so we have to end it here. But um, thank you all very much and thank you all for coming.